so glad that, that we serve a Savior who looked beyond our faults and saw our needs. And uh, our greatest need, of course, was the need to have our sins forgiven. I'm so thankful for that. Open your Bibles, if you would, this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and uh, verse 16. We're going to pick up where we left off last Sunday. I do want to say to our church family, Jana and I were absolutely overwhelmed by your kindness uh, to us. As you recognized, uh, 10 years it was actually our uh, my first Sunday as pastor was the 31st of August on in 2008. And uh, boy, time flies when you're having fun. I'm just going to tell you now. Uh, God has been so good and so faithful. And I want to say to you uh, on behalf of Jana and me how much we love you and how much we appreciate you. And uh, your kindness to us uh, is always overwhelming to us. And we appreciate it so, so very much. Do be praying for this Patterson family, uh, if you would please, Brother Ray mentioned, and uh, we're going to see what we can do, if anything at all, uh, to minister to those uh, in this family. We don't know, uh, just don't have any details, but uh, be, be much in prayer uh, for those uh, kids in particular. My heart's broken for them this morning. We're in... 2 Timothy chapter 3, we began last week a, a message, actually three weeks ago, uh, this really didn't start to turn into a series, but considering that our kids were going back to school, uh, three weeks ago I spoke on the issue of authority and uh, where authority comes from. All authority comes from God. And then the next week we spoke on truth and uh, the idea of Absolute truth, absolute truth. Uh, there is such a thing as absolute truth and it is absolutely only found in God. All truth, someone said, is God's truth. And, and so there is such a thing as absolute truth. Last week, uh, we said, how are we going to know the truth? And we know the truth from God's word. And I began a message on the inspiration uh, of God, the truth of uh, of God's word. And our text verse is verse 16 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, that verse begins, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now that literally means all scripture is God breathed. We talked about that last week. And we began the message uh, today from that little phrase which sets before us the inspiration of the greatest book, the only real book of truth, God's word, the Bible. And we're told here that the Bible is God breathed. Now we were looking at three thoughts beginning at the end of the phrase, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Uh, all scripture is God breathed. That sets before us the supernatural inspiration of the Bible. It, it is only uh, about the Bible that it can be said this is a God breathed book. It can be said of no other book. This is a God breathed book. God breathed the words uh, into this book. God used human authors, certainly. We talked about that, that last week. 1 Peter 1.21 uh, says holy, meaning specifically set apart men. Uh, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And that word moved uh, means that they were, uh, that they were uh, a, 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 like a sailing vessel being blown along by a gentle breeze or a wind. Uh, or a wind. And so this verse sets before us the supernatural inspiration of the Bible. All scripture is God breathed. The second thought that we looked at last week focuses on that word scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Uh, all scripture. Now that word scripture sets before us the verbal inspiration of the Bible. And we'll continue that thought in just a moment. And then the first word, which is where we will spend the, the majority of our time today, is that very first word, all. All Scripture 
is given by inspiration of God. And that sets before us the total inspiration of the Bible. You said, preacher, are you going to be able to get a message out of that one phrase, all scripture is given by inspiration of God? Well, evidently, I've got two. This is the second half uh, of, the, uh, of the one. And, uh, and I want to tell you there's more in this than I'm going to be able to give you today. I started with so many pages and I've cut and cut and cut and cut. Uh, but I am excited to tell you that God's word is totally inspired. All scripture is God breathed. Supernatural inspiration, God breathed. Verbal inspiration, all scripture. And the word scripture obviously is making reference to the words. We talk about the concept of verbal inspiration and how God communicates uh, to us through the words of Scripture. Uh, words are the vehicles of communication. We communicate to one another by words. I wonder how many of you went home last week and you tried to, to, to think thoughts without words. Did anybody try to do that? Uh, I mean, I sat down and tried to think thoughts without words. And you know what I thought of? This is stupid, and I used words to tell myself that. It's not possible. I, I tried thinking thoughts with pictures. I couldn't come up with any words to describe it. I can't tell you about my pictures without words. I, can, I had pictures. You got pictures? But you got to have words to describe. I can't. I can show you a flashcard, but you don't have any idea what I see in the picture. Isn't that right? Take a picture of anything. What are you going to point out? Words. It is words that communicate. I use words this morning. I'm using words to communicate to your mind and your heart what is in my mind and in my heart. We're told specifically that the Bible, uh, the, the Scripture, is the literal Word of God to you and to me. In the Old Testament, you might find this interesting. In the Old Testament, there are, I, I, I've been told, I, I've read that there are phrases uh, like God said or thus saith the Lord used over 3,800 times in the Old Testament alone. Now, if God didn't say the words that followed that, God said or thus saith the Lord, then those authors who quoted him that way are the most common and most consistent liars on record. In 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 13, the Apostle Paul set before us the idea of the words of the Bible being inspired. Notice uh, this verse which we looked at last week. It says, which things we also speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, meaning the words that the Holy Spirit teaches. We find those words that the Holy Spirit teaches all over the pages of your Bible. When you pick up your Bible, when you look at the words of your Bible, you are looking at the very words of God. Now you might say, what does Jesus have to say about verbal inspiration? About the words of the Bible being inspired? Now you will all understand this morning, if you're a believer, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you know that Jesus is God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus is God uh, in the flesh. He is the one who came. But Jesus is every bit God as God the Father, every bit God uh, as God the Spirit. Uh, and Jesus, God in the flesh, came to this earth. And when Jesus spoke on this earth, He was and is the final authority. There is no greater authority in, on this earth than the words of Jesus Christ. Whatever Jesus says on any subject is the end of the argument. And so what Jesus teaches about the inspiration of the Bible and about verbal inspiration, that's what we have to believe. We must believe it because Jesus said it. Does that, do we all understand that? We all agree with that. So let's just determine this morning what Jesus taught about verbal inspiration. Look over at Matthew chapter 24. Now we'll put it on the screens, but if you've got your Bible or you've got your app, it'd be really good for you to turn to Matthew uh, chapter 24. And I want you to, to see a statement of the Lord Jesus down in verse 35 of Matthew chapter 24. Here's what it says. 
Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. There is something eternal about the words of Jesus Christ. Now you may have one of those Bibles, my particular, what I call my preaching Bible. I use an old Chriswell study Bible that's been out of print for about 25 years. Uh, but it doesn't have the words of Christ in red. But some Bibles uh, put the words of Christ in red. Anybody have a Bible you're holding like that this morning? Okay, good. Good. Well, when you see that, uh, they, they, some Bibles put the words of Jesus in red specifically just to identify that it's God talking. It's Jesus talking uh, to identify the words. Well, in Matthew chapter 4, uh, in Matthew chapter 4, we find the, uh, the record of when Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. And three times Satan came to Jesus, three times he tempted him, and three times Jesus uses an almost identical phrase. In verse 4, at the first temptation, Jesus said, it is written. And then he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. In the second temptation in verse 7, Jesus answered saying, it is written again. And he quotes Deuteronomy 6.16. In the third temptation, in verse 10, he says, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written. And then he quotes Deuteronomy 6.13. So three occasions here, Jesus refers to the written word of God. Jesus used the very words of Scripture to defeat the temptations of the devil. Now, if you look at verse 4, there in, in Matthew 4, Jesus said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but listen to the rest of it, but by... Every what? Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He's quoting Deuteronomy 8.3, but it is an affirmation by the Lord Jesus Christ. The very fact that he quotes this is an affirmation of his acceptance of the verbal word for word inspiration of the Bible. In Matthew 5. If you just keep flipping through Matthew, Matthew 5, we see the strongest statement, certainly anywhere in the scriptures, concerning the words of the Bible being inspired. Look what it says, Matthew 5 and verse 18. Don't get ahead of me, Shad. 518, here's what he says. For verily I say unto you, Shad's my son, by the way. I wasn't being mean to the, to the media guy. I'm being mean to my son, just so you know. Let me go back, I want because we're on a roll here, and I, at least i got to keep my mind going. You, you stay with me, all right? In Matthew 5, this is the strongest statement you're going to find anywhere uh, uh, concerning the words, the very words of the Bible being inspired. This is what Jesus said in verse 18. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now this comes from the lips of none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That word verily is the word where we get our word amen. This is true. It's a positive word of affirmation. Verily, it is true. This is the case. And he says here, this little word, he said, I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot. Now jot the word jot that Jesus is referring to here is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. If you were to look at that letter, it looks like just a little bit of a comma. It's kind of what it looks like to us. It doesn't even... If, remember the pads that we used to call them the, the big chief writing tablets? Uh, what, do everybody ever have any of those? You know what I'm talking about? All right. Well, if you were writing a jot, if you were writing Hebrew and you were writing a jot, it wouldn't even take the full top half of the space. So it's, it's almost the size of a comma. That's an actual letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It is the smallest letter. And God says that smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet is not going to pass away. Heaven and earth can pass away. Heaven and earth is going to pass away one day. But not even the smallest letter in, in the word of God is going to pass away. That's what he's saying. And then he talks about a tittle. A jot and a tittle. Now let me tell you what a tittle is. If you take that little comma, okay, and you make that comma kind of a, uh, make it almost like a, a wall with a flat roof, okay? A, flaw, a wall with a flat roof, a little bitty mark like that. Well, if you were to give that flat roof an overhang, one thirty-second of an inch, 
Okay, so a tittle is a little overhang on a Hebrew letter. It actually changes a word completely. Uh, it, it, it can change the meaning of something completely. If a little 30 second overhang hangs off of one of those letters, one 30 second, one 30 second of an inch. I mean, you can't hard, it, those of us who look, I don't even cross all my T's. Sometimes I dot L's. My name is J-E-N-N-I-N-G-S. That dot over my I can show up just about anywhere. By the way, my first name is Dennis. Spelled backwards, it's sin. It's always with me. Okay? So what, we're, what Jesus... Our equivalent in the English language... Size-wise is the dot over the eye. And what Jesus is saying here is that heaven and earth are going to pass away. But the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet and the smallest little mark that can be written in the Word of God is going to last forever. Listen to what he says. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Jesus not only believed in the verbal inspiration of the Bible, he believed in letter inspiration of the Bible. He believed in the little extension of that letter being inspired in the Word. Now that's a pretty strong affirmation of the whole matter of verbal inspiration of the Scriptures. That's the concept, the concept of verbal inspiration. But what about the content of verbal inspiration? When we talk about the Bible being totally verbally inspired, what do we mean when we say that the words are inspired, that these words are divinely inspired? It simply means this. Whatever words the Bible uses on whatever subject, those words are dependable and accurate. Whatever words the Bible uses on whatever subject, those words are dependable and accurate. Now, the Bible is not primarily a book of history, nor is it a book of science. But when it speaks on those subjects, it does so accurately. There are no inaccurate words in your Bible on on historical or scientific matters. Jesus said in John 3, 12, If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? What he's saying is, if you can't believe what I've said about earthly matters, then how will you believe about heavenly or spiritual matters? If you pick up a, a book of physics, which I can be honest with you, I have looked through, didn't understand a thing, closed it right up. But here's what I will tell you. In a book of, of, of physics, in a physics test, textbook, there are all kinds of, of statements about physics. But if you pick up a book on physics, you're also going to know that there are also statements there about math. Things I can't understand. But if you're reading a physics book and you find that the, the physics book is inaccurate in its mathematical statements certainly it would undermine your confidence in its statements concerning the matters of physics, wouldn't it? If you can't believe what it says about math, how are you going to believe what it says about physics? Well, the same thing is true in in the Word of God. If you can't believe the words of the Bible concerning creation, how can you believe the words of the Bible concerning salvation? If you can't believe Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created, how can you believe John 3-16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son? They're intertwined. You cannot pull them apart. If you can't believe what the Bible says about history, then how do you believe what the Bible says about eternity? The fact is... The spiritual statements of the Bible are inextricably interwoven with the historical and scientific statements of God's Word. Let me give you two examples. The first example is the the example of the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is absolutely one of the essential doctrines in all the Word of God. Wouldn't we agree with that? 
The Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ was not born like ordinary people are born. When you and I were born, it took a male and a female. But when Jesus was born, he was born of a virgin girl conceived by the Holy Spirit. That is theological truth. That is doctrinal truth. It is absolutely essential. If Jesus Christ is not born of a virgin, then the whole thing caves in. If Jesus was born like we are born, that means he was born with a sin nature, which means he was a sinner. And if Jesus was a sinner, he couldn't have died on a cross for, his, for our sins because he would have had to die for his own. He, I, I am telling you, if Jesus Christ were not virgin born, the whole Christian faith washes completely out. It cannot be a fact. Now, when we're talking about matters of the virgin birth, aren't we talking about biology? It most certainly is. That's why Luke, the physician, spent so much time in the first chapter of his gospel dealing with the matter of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. He was aware of the fact that when you deal with the virgin birth, you are in the presence of a biological miracle. So if the virgin birth is biological fiction, then it's also theological fiction. If Jesus was not born of a virgin and that is not biologically true, then it cannot be spiritually true. So the virgin birth ties together biology and history and theology and salvation. The second example is the example of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about things uh, where the Bible has to be accurate on history and science if it's going to be accurate in anything. If, you're, if you can trust it for, for spiritual things, you have to be able to trust it for historical, scientific things. It, it cannot, you can't have it both ways. The second example is the resurrection. Was that a fact of history? Well, I'm told that for, for history... To be a fact, there are two essentials necessary. There has to be a place and there has to be a time. There has to be a where and a when. Where and when did it happen? Well, what about the resurrection? Somebody said, well, Jesus really wasn't literally raised from the dead. His body literally didn't come out of that grave. Well, ask, let me ask you a question then. What kind of a resurrection is it if it wasn't a literal resurrection? There was a time, it was on a Sunday morning, we know that. And there was a place, it was at the garden tomb. The Lord Jesus conquered death, arose and came out of that grave and he's alive forevermore. So if you can't believe the history of the resurrection, how in the world can you believe in the theology of the resurrection? They are tied together. You can't separate them. That's why it's absolutely intellectual nonsense to talk about spiritual matters of the Bible being inspired, but the other matters of the Bible being uninspired. It's just not true. What am I saying? What am I, what I am saying is what God said in His Word. And that is all Scripture, all of the words of the Bible are inspired, verbally inspired. Verbally inspired. I love the words of the Bible. Think about what He means here. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Think about some of these words. Salvation. Regeneration. Justification, sanctification, glorification, love, joy, peace. These beautiful, wonderful words of the Bible, they convey truth and meaning to our hearts. Jesus put it this way in John chapter 6 and verse 63. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. These words are verbally inspired, verbally breathed words by God, and there is life. There is power in the words of your Bible. That's good stuff. I'm just telling you right now, that's good stuff. And so, I'm almost through with the introduction. And the recap from last Sunday. All Scripture is God-breathed. That is supernatural inspiration. All Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture, I need to say it that way, all Scripture is God-breathed. That's verbal inspiration. Now look, let's look at the very first word, 
all Scripture. That means total inspiration. Now, we've touched on this a little bit, but stay with me because this is the best part. The word all, you know what it means? All. It means the whole. It means every part of the whole. It means every single part of the whole is totally inspired of God. All scripture is breathed. It is inspired of God. That, l- l- let, me, let me explain to you what that means. This is really deep what I'm fixing to tell you. That means that no scripture is not inspired by God. Now, we might appreciate or value some parts over the others. For instance, if you were to ask me which verse means more to me, uh, the genealogy of Moses or John 3.16, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to spend a whole lot more time contemplating the fact that God so loved this whole world that He gave His only Son that whosoever... I'm a whosoever, you're a whosoever. I've spent a lot more time thinking on the fact that God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish. I've spent a lot of time thinking about perishing. I don't want to die and go to hell because of my sins. And he says, I don't have to because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, I'm a whosoever, shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I've spent a long time thinking about everlasting life. I can't tell you how much time I've spent thinking about the the genealogy of Moses. So what I'm telling you is while we may appreciate or value some parts of the Bible over others, they are all equally inspired. Now let me give you one more, and you stay with me all the way on this one because I might shock you. That doesn't mean that all the statements in the Bible are true statements. They'll make you nervous. Let let me show you what I mean. In the Garden of Eden, the the devil said to to Adam and Eve, Thou shalt not surely die. Was that true or false? You haven't seen Adam and Eve walking around here. They died a long time ago. And so the statement that the devil said was not true. They died. The devil is a liar. And there are statements in the Bible made by the devil that are not true. But it is true that the devil made those statements. And that's a very important distinction. So all, what does all mean? Put it up there, Shad. Total inspiration means that every line, every sentence, every word, every letter, every stroke of the pen is totally inspired of God. Now, I want you to know that the devil has spent a long time, literally since the garden, trying to undermine that. You go back to Genesis chapter 3, and before Adam and Eve sinned, the temptation of the devil was to get them to believe something false about God. To not believe God's word. I'm going to tell you, the devil's been working that plan for thousands and thousands of years. You say, what are you talking about? Hey, listen. In the, just go back, we don't even have to go back all that far. The beginning of the 19th, of the 20th century. Something called higher criticism came from Germany across Europe to the United States. And, and it came into vogue. You might have heard back in the, in the olden days, like when I was a boy, you used to hear preachers talk about modernists. Modernists. They're talking about these people who attack the inspiration of the Bible. So-called intellectuals question the authority, the accuracy, and the authorship of the Word of God. Their approach was known as higher criticism. Ultimately, it uh, it was given the moniker destructive criticism of the Bible. 
Their approach was to assume that the Bible is no more inspired than the writings of Shakespeare or some other of the great authors of the history of the world. You might remember the name William Jennings Bryan. He was a, a famous attorney, a Christian uh, a, a Christian man, a statesman. He ran for president. He, he was the secretary of state at one point. William Jennings Bryan spent the latter part of his life uh, really as a defender of the faith. And William Jennings Bryan wrote about those who took this destructive criticism approach to the word of God. And I want to read you just a couple of experts from something that he wrote. He said this, religion is a matter of the heart. And the impulses of the heart often seem foolish to the mind. Faith is different from and superior to reason. Faith is a spiritual extension of the vision, a moral sense that reaches out toward the throne of God and takes hold of truths that mind cannot reason out. It is like the blind leading the blind for a higher critic, however, however honest they are, to rely on purely intellectual methods to convey truths that the Bible says are spiritually discerned. As a rule, he goes on to say, the so-called higher critic is a man without spiritual vision, without zeal for souls, without any deep interest in the coming of God's kingdom. He does not accept the Bible nor defend it. He mutilates it. He puts the Bible on the operating table and cuts out the parts that he thinks are diseased. When he has finished his work, the Bible is no longer a book of books. It's simply a scrap of paper. And this is how he kind of sums it up. The higher critic begins his investigations with his opinion already formed. After he has discarded the Bible, he labors to find evidence to support his preconceived notions. He is a doubter and he spreads doubts. Isn't that exactly what Satan did from the very beginning? And the devil has ever since eroded confidence and instilled doubt in the hearts of people about the Bible. The devil says there is no such thing as the supernatural in the Bible. The miracles are not true. And he says to you, your Bible is not inspired. And, and, and then, then he says that uh, there, there are only portions of the Bible may be inspired. Uh, somebody called that spot inspiration. You know what the problem with spot inspiration is? You got to have somebody else to tell you what's inspired and what spot's not. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The devil uses critics of the Bible to pry it from the hands and the hearts of people and rob them of the only book that can tell them how to get to heaven. The only book that can give them peace in the times of problems. The only book that can show them how to live the way God wants them to live. Today, we must affirm the total inspiration of the Bible. All of the Word of God is inspired. It is God-breathed. And what did Jesus say about it? I ask you to look back over in the book of Luke, chapter 24. Show you a few verses from Luke 24. Listen to what Jesus said. Now, in, in Genesis 24, I'm sorry, Luke 24, Jesus is already resurrected. And he is walking on the road to Emmaus with two disciples. And in verse 25, Jesus said, listen to this now, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now do you see what Jesus said there? Jesus is saying that if you don't believe all that the prophet has spoken, you are a fool and slow of heart. What it means is you've got a head problem and a heart problem. Then look down at verse 27, same chapter. Beginning at Moses and what? All the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Do you believe that Jesus believed the Bible was all inspired? Total inspiration. That's what Jesus believed. Look down at verse 44. Jesus said, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet 
with you that all, there it is again, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Jesus affirmed total inspiration. All of it's inspired. Well, you might say, well, preacher, yeah, but he's talking about the Old Testament. I mean, the, the, the New Testament wasn't even written then. Well, I want to show you that Jesus affirmed the inspiration of the New Testament. How, how did he do that? Look at John 14. In John 14 and verse 26, Jesus is talking to his disciples right before he's going to the cross to die for the sins of the world. He's spending time with them, preparing them for what's about to come. He's getting them ready now for their ministry. And look what he says in John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. These apostles were going to be set apart for the specific task of writing down the scriptures, writing down the things that Jesus said. How in the world were they going to remember all of that? Jesus told us, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is going to come and is going to bring to your remembrance all things, all things. Look what he says over in chapter 16 of the book of John in verse 13. Jesus says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. What am I saying? What I'm saying is that Jesus stamped his authority on the ministry of the apostles to write the New Testament. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is inspired of God. It is God-breathed. That means that all the miracles of the Bible are true. I believe that Jonah really was swallowed up by a great fish and three days and three nights he spent in the belly of that fish before he was regurgitated onto land. I believe that really happened because the Bible says it did. I believe that Daniel spent the night in the lion's den. Now, I, I got all kinds of speculation of what happened that night. I think... Dying, uh, Daniel had a lion pillow. He was lying on a pillow. <laughs> but here's what I believe. Daniel spent that whole night in a lion's den with hungry lions. And God closed their mouth and Daniel came out unharmed. You know why I believe that? Because the Bible says it to be so. I believe that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus was dead four days, and the Bible says he's stinking. There, there was already an aroma of death about Lazarus, and yet Jesus cried, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus came out of that grave, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and Jesus commanded them to loose him and let him go. Some people say, well, Lazarus wasn't really dead. Yeah, don't tell that to Lazarus. <laughs> you say, you really believe that? I believe it because the Bible says it's so. And I believe that Jesus rose from the dead himself. That Jesus is alive forevermore. Why do I believe it? Because the Bible says so. When it comes to our Bible, now I want you to stay with me on this. When it comes to our Bible, 2 Peter 3.16 tells us that there are some things in it that are hard to understand. You say, preacher, do you understand everything about the Bible? Not even close. Not even close. But God has revealed himself in the pages of this book. But here's the problem. The reason I have trouble understanding is because I've got a little puny pea brain. And God is infinite. The mind of God is infinite. And when I bring my little finite brain to try to get a hold of the infinite mind of God, I, I don't even think he would be God if I could understand it all. Do you? He is, you should expect to have some difficulties 
God is infinitely far and above our ability to understand. But here's what I know. What I know is that when there are things in the Bible that you don't understand or, or maybe that don't make sense to you, hang on. Because God has a way of allowing new information to come and, and it'll clear it up later. There are so Ask our archaeology friend right here, Brother Ray. How many times in, in history some, something was said that the Bible can't be true because they found this or they found that in archaeology and it completely contradicts the Word of God. And how many times, I mean, how many times a year does it happen, it seems like, that, that there is another uh, archaeological discovery that, that once again verifies that what people said forever caused the Bible to be a lie. No, the history finally catches up with the truth, the inspired word of God, and they find out that what the Bible said was true all along. I, we could, I, I left pages of this out, but I am going to tell you about one guy. Anybody ever heard of a fellow by the name of Robert Dick Wilson? Anybody? Robert Dick Wilson was a professor of Semitic languages at Princeton. He died in the early 1900s. He was known as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, biblical linguist of all time. He, that's a person who studies languages. He devoted his entire life to answering the critics of the Bible. He learned Greek, Aramaic, Hebrew, Latin, German, French, Egyptian, Coptic, Syriac. I mean, he learned those. He also was conversant in 45 other languages and dialects. Let me tell you what kind of man Robert Dick Wilson was. In order to answer one statement critical of the Bible from one critic, he read all of the languages that had anything written touching that subject or the period of time that that thing took place. He, he had to master all of the languages that would be necessary for him to understand what all of those writings from all those places about that time. He collated over 100,000 notations that approached the issue from one way or another. And when all of the facts were arranged and considered together, he proved the critic wrong. He proved him wrong. And listen to what he, he said. After 45 years of scholarly research in biblical textual studies and language study, I have come to the conclusion that no man knows enough to assail the truthfulness of the Bible. You see, your Bible is supernaturally, verbally, and totally inspired. And so the question is, do you read it? The same Holy Spirit who inspired common men to write your Bible is the same Holy Spirit who will illumine common people like you and me to read God's Word and to be blessed by it. Ultimately, it comes down to a matter of your faith. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2. Shed, put that up on the screen for me. Look at what it says. For unto us was the, was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. What's he saying? What he's saying is that ultimately... You don't approach the Bible with just your mind. You have to approach the Bible with your heart. And you have to, by faith, receive it as the Word of God. You say, well, I don't accept things by faith. Yes, you do. You did when you sat down on the chair you're sitting in right now. You don't know the person who made it. You had no idea that it would not collapse underneath your little or maybe not so little weight. But you exercised faith when you sat down in that chair. You exercised faith all the time. And you have to, you, you didn't sit here, walk in this room and ponder whether or not which chair in here might be the one that would hold you up. 
You came in and you did what I did. I plopped my big old self down in whichever chair came close to me. And I didn't give it a thought. Because the Bible says that we do live by faith. Everybody lives by faith all the time. You go to bed at night, you've you got faith that you're going to wake up in the morning. We all live by faith. And we have to approach the Word of God and receive it as the Word of God and acknowledge that it is the Word of God by faith. When I was in junior high school, I was saved. And I was really hungry for the truth. Never been much of an intellectual. I mean, I came from Alabama, for goodness sake. There's a lot of smart people that come from Alabama, by the way, just so you know. But, but I'm not one of them. <laughs> but I was really hungry for the truth. And there was a teacher in my junior high school who was a well-meaning person. She was as sincere as anybody you would ever know. She was a Christian. She went to a Baptist church every Sunday. But she was a lady who'd bought into this whole destructive criticism thing. And when I was in junior high school, she convinced me that the miraculous way in which God created the world wasn't miraculous at all. I listened to it. And I adopted, because I listened to what she said about that, I adopted a lot of false views about everything from God, from things about God, to things about history, to things about uh, the, the Word of God. But can I tell you that I had a church where every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, there was a man of God who stood in the pulpit of that church. And he proclaimed, Thus saith the Lord. He preached the book. I had Sunday school teachers who opened the Word of God every Sunday morning and taught us from the Bible. And every time I had a question, it didn't, didn't matter whether I asked my pastor or I asked one of my Sunday school teachers, I asked, asked my youth director, it did not matter who I asked. One by one, they opened the Bible and they, they always said, well, let's see what the Bible says about this. What does the Bible say? And I will tell you, without going through a whole lot of, lot of time, the good news is that although... I was still going to church and still having all those doubts that before my senior year of high school, God got a hold of my heart. At that time, I realized that I had trusted Him with my soul. There was never a question about whether I trusted Him with my soul. But the real question was, did I trust him about anything else? And I came to the conclusion that if I had trusted him with my eternal soul, that it doesn't even make sense for me not to trust every word that he has spoken to me about everything in this life. And it was a decision of faith that changed the, the, the trajectory of my life from that day until this. I have tried to put the Bible to work in my life personally. I've tried to put the Bible to work in my family. I've tried to put the, the Bible to work in my ministry, uh, both as a, a, as a staff pastor and as a senior pastor of churches. And I'm here to tell you that I know the Bible was sent from God. I know that it's divinely inspired the whole way through. I know that this Bible is the Word of God. I know it's true. And I want to conclude the message this morning the same way I did last Sunday. I want to say to you that God wrote to you and me personally in this book. He didn't write it for the library. He didn't write it for the study of theology. God wrote the book. He gave the words to you and to me. And this book has the words of salvation in it. Paul said to young Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15 that this Bible is able to make you wise unto salvation. And so this morning, as I did last Sunday, I want to give you three verses, the inspired words of God to you right now 
That will explain to you how to be saved, how to be forgiven of your sins, how to go to heaven when you die. Here's the first one. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I am a sinner and I need a Savior. The second one is this. Romans 5.12 But God commendeth That means he demonstrated, he showed, he proved his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Remember, he didn't have to die for any sins of his own because he didn't have any. He was the sinless son of God. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine. And here's the third one. All of that's true. All of that is true. That we're sinners and Jesus died to pay for our sins. But here's the only way that you can have forgiveness. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. You have to believe that he's the Lord, that he's the son of God. And believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead. It's not enough for you to even acknowledge a historical fact. But you've got to be willing to put your faith. You've got to be willing to put your whole weight on what Jesus did. Just like you put your weight on that chair. You put all of your weight, all of your hope for eternal life, for forgiveness of sin. The only way you can get to heaven is to put all of your weight. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. It's not how it happens. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You have to believe in your heart that Jesus is who he said he was. And that he died on the cross and three days later he rose from the grave. And the Bible says if you'll believe that, thou, it doesn't say might be, could be, maybe, look at the verse, thou shalt be saved. Dear friends, those are not the words of men. Those are God's words. And they are God's words to you right now, right here in the service. If you'll ask God to forgive you of your sins and with all of your heart invite Jesus to come into your life, He will save you today, this very morning. Bow your heads with me. Maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, Dennis, I am saved and I, am, and I know that I'm saved and I'm a member of Cherry Street Baptist Church. Hold your hand up really high if you would, please. Give that testimony. Lots of folks like that. So many. Thank you so much. Others are here. You say, I'm not a member of Cherry Street, but I am a member of the family of God. I know that I'm on my way to heaven because I trusted Jesus as my Savior. And I'm not ashamed of that. Slip up your hand and say, I'm happy to give testimony to that. I'm saved and I know it. I'm not a member of Cherry Street, but I'm a member of the family of God. Hold it up for just a moment. A lot of folks like that this morning. God bless you. If you don't have a church home, you need one. If you live in Springfield or, or the surrounding areas, why don't you just... Right now, if you don't have a church home, pray this prayer. God, what do you want me to do about my church membership? And if the Holy Spirit of God speaks to your heart, we would invite you this morning to come. Our pastors will be here and we'll be so excited to talk to you and welcome you into this church family today. Maybe you're here this morning and you would say, Dennis, I'm saved and I know it. I've already raised my hands in that. And I know that God's word is God's word, but the truth of the matter is I, I, I know a whole lot more about God's word than I'm being obedient to it right now in my life. If, if this is God's word, and I know it is, and you, you would tell me, preacher, yeah, I know it's God's word. You would say there's some things I know that God's word says that just aren't true in my life. There's some things where I know I'm not living up to what God wants from me. And, and Pastor, I... If these are the words of God for me personally, I need to take it a little more seriously. There's some things I need to work through. Would you pray for me about that? I'd love to do that this morning. Would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, that's where I'm at. Yes, sir, I see it. I see your hand. Anybody else? Pray for me. There's some some things. Yes, sir, thank you. I see it. Somebody else? Pray for me. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. 
There are just some things I need to work through, some things in my life that aren't what they ought to be. Pastor, pray for me about those things. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I sure will. Yes, sir. I sure will. Anybody else? Pray for me about those things. Maybe you're here this morning and you could not raise your hand on any of the previous propositions because you're not sure that if you died today that your sins will be forgiven and that heaven will be your eternal home. You're not sure that you're saved. And you'd say, Dennis, it sounds like it's the most important thing in life. It is. The most important thing you'll ever settle is knowing for sure that your sins are forgiven and that heaven is your home. It doesn't matter who you, where you are, where you're from. It doesn't matter how you grew up. It only matters what your destination is. And it's either heaven or that awful place of called hell to, to pay for your sins yourself. And you just don't want to do that. How many of you this morning would say, Dennis, pray for me. I'm, I'm not sure, but I want to be sure. I want to go to heaven when I die. I want to be forgiven of my sin. Would you just, just slip your hand up and say, that's where I'm at this morning. Pray for me. I'm not sure about it, but I want to be sure more than anything. I want to know that Jesus is my Savior. If I'd like that this morning, pray for me. I'm not sure about it. Yes, ma'am, I will. Thank you. Somebody else? Anybody else? Pray for me this morning. Yes, sir, I will. Thank you. Anybody else? Pray for me. I'm not sure about it. I'm going to pray for you, sir. Absolutely, I'm going to pray for you this morning. Anybody else? Let's stand to our feet. Lord Jesus, we love you today. We thank you for all that you do. We thank you, Lord, that you made it possible for us to have your word that we can stand on, that we can know is truly the words of God. Lord, there are some people in this place today who are your kids, who are living for you, who are standing on the promises of your word, who are living the truths of your word in their life. God, I thank you for them, and I pray that you continue to help them. There's some folks here in this place today who need a church home. I pray that as we sing this very first verse of invitation, if you want them as part of our Cherry Street family, that they would step out and meet one of our pastors. We'll be so thrilled to have them receive them here this morning. There's some of your kids here today, Lord, who understand your word enough about it to know that they're not living the way they need to. Some of them have, have lifted their hands and asked today that we pray for them. And God, I ask you that, you that you would help them today. Convict their hearts about things that they need to deal with. Help them to understand the truth of your word. And Lord, we pray that you reveal all the areas of their life that they need to deal with. Thank you, Lord, for allowing them to confess their sin and be in sweet fellowship with you. I pray they would come today and restore that fellowship that they can have with you. Lord, in this place this morning, there are people here who do not know you as Savior. Some of them, Lord, they, they've heard it. They know what they've heard. They just have never acted upon the truth. Lord, I pray that today they would consider the truth of your word. Consider the objections of so many, and yet your word stands the test of eternity. I pray, God, today that those who do not know you as Savior would put aside their pride and, and anything else that might prohibit them from stepping out from where they are coming and meeting one of our pastors who will have somebody take the Bible and show them how they can leave here today knowing that they're forgiven and on their way to heaven. May no one go away without Jesus is our prayer today. May no one leave as the invitation is extended and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' precious name we pray. The Holy Spirit of God spoken to you for any reason this morning. We invite you to come right now on this first verse as we sing. Come just as you